Can you hear me in the back? Is this projecting? Is it okay? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, this is, uh, talk will be on the Plura. I haven't talked, uh, spoken on the Plura in quite a while, and yet it's one of the things that got me into my career in academic medicine. So, after 32 years here, uh, on the way out, I thought I would give you a perspective on the Plura um, as I uh, experienced it, and it's one of the major attractions, actually, that got me into pulmonary medicine in the first place. Plural effusions are common. Uh, we can learn valuable information about them. Um, there's a lot of confusion about different aspects of pleural disease. So I thought I'd go through some of the uh, uh, things I've learned about the pleura, some helpful pointers for the house staff when you encounter a pleural effusion, um, so that you can think clearly about them. And then along the way, we'll visit some, uh, uh, some, some uh, interesting uh, people that have been in the institution and some of the things they did. So, without further ado. Oops. This way. Um, <clears throat> as this slide shows, pleural effusions are amazingly common. Um, heart failure alone in this country probably accounts for 500,000 uh, cases a year. Uh, so, if you're on the wards and you see somebody with a pleural effusion, in any sort of history of heart disease, there's an excellent chance it could be heart failure. Um, the other two most common are paranomonic effusions. What's a paranomonic effusion? A paranomonic effusion is any effusion that's associated with a bacterial infection. It doesn't have to be an empyema. All empyemas are paranomonic effusions, but not all paranomonic effusions are empyemas. Uh, it excludes tuberculosis, which as you can see, is down here. Um, malignant effusions, uh, very common as well. Really, lung, breast, and lymphoma account for the vast majority. So, if you take congestive heart failure, infections, and malignancy, that accounts for a million effusions. And mo uh, far more than the rest of them combined. Okay, so can you remember that? Remember the three, chronic ca three causes of chronic cough, post-nasal drip, asthma, and GERD? Well, here you go with pleural effusions, heart failure, infection, uh, malignancy, okay? So that's a good, good way to start. Now, pulmonary embolism is a commonly missed, unfortunately, cause of uh, pleural effusion. So uh, you need to think about that one, because if you miss it, the, re the results can be devastating. <clears throat> Lesson number one is the plural, the plural space is real. It is a real space uh, in all of us, and it only holds 10 to 12 cc's of fluid in a normal size human beings. Um, it's about 10 to 20 microns wide. This is the actual plural space from a frozen animal. I'm not sure what kind of animal, but as you can see, here it is, right here. Here's the chest wall. Here's the lung, and here's the pleural space. The visceral pleura, which is just like saran wrap, wraps around the lung. And the parietal pleura wraps around the chest wall. They are amazingly smooth, and if you ever have done any animal experiments um, and been in the lab and done pleural experiments on an animal, as you, as you cut down through the chest, you can see the pink lung gliding effortlessly against the chest wall in these experimental lab uh, preparations. So you come to understand that one of the reasons we have a pleura is to provide a frictionless surface so the lung can expand and deflate. <clears throat> Here it is, um, the uh, parietal pleura that invests the chest wall is in purple and the visceral pleura is in uh, light blue and here's the pleural space here Obviously, in this preparation, there's been shrinkage because it's not nearly that big. Notice it goes all the way around the lung and goes up to the uh, root of the lungs in the mediastinum where they stop and connect. Um, <clears throat> there are lymphatics all through the mediastinum, and as I'll show you in a minute, the lymphatic drainage from the pleural space goes right to the mediastinal uh, uh, lymph nodes and is part of the drainage system of the pleural space. As part of my early training, I was investigating um, the pleura in uh, dogs, 
And so these are some of the early slides that I made of visceral pleura. And you can see here, this is an isolated preparation. And notice, number one, it's very thin. I don't have a marker here, but it's very thin. And these little fat cells are very important. These are mesothelial cells, the most common cells in the pleural space. They are not just there for um, no reason. And people in this room, namely Sean Milligan, uh, uh, as well as his uh, uh, partner, uh, Mike Owens, have published many papers and made uh, much grant money studying these little cells right here, the mesothelial cell. The parietal pleura is a little thicker and it's different than the visceral pleura. Um, it has uh, interesting structures on it uh, called uh, stoma and that's the way we drain the pleural space is through the stoma in the parietal pleura. These are those little mesothelial cells. They look like uh, buns, hot cross buns, and they have little um, microvilli on the surface of them. Presumably they are used to increase absorptive area for the uh, uh, cells, uh, but we don't quite know for sure. They secrete components of the extracellular matrix, certainly collagen and several other components, and they help in remodeling of the pleural space after you say you have a, uh, a nasty complicated pleural effusion. They secrete uh, extracellular proteins that help remodel the pleural space. They have uh, valuable um, uh, phagocytotic properties. Uh, they uh, secrete chemotactic factors that attract neutrophils and uh, lymphocytes into the pleural space to fight infections. And they produce cytokines. Uh, transforming growth factor beta, epidermal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, and no doubt several others. Now here is the, um, here is the uh, parietal pleura. I think this is from a rabbit or a mouse. This is a scanning EM, and you can see in this uh, scanning EM these openings right here, uh, and these are the way pleural fluid and even cells exit Plural space. Yeah, what? Turn off your cell phone. It's huh? interfering with it. Oh. Here, give it to me. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you. I don't either, but I'm uh, Okay. Um, so here's our, here are the, uh, this is the egress from the plural space uh, through the parietal pleura into the uh, underlying lymphatics in the chest wall and thence to the mediastinal lymph nodes. And uh, into the thoracic duct. This looks like the opening to Carlsbad Caverns, but it is not. This uh, actually is a fairly sizable opening, uh, though this is just a close-up of the stoma in the parietal pleura. And it's big enough that red blood cells, as in this sheep or rabbit uh, preparation, can go into these holes and right along the uh, subpleural uh, uh, lymphatics uh, to the uh, mediastinal uh, drainage uh, system. Now, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, I bet this is important in the pathogenesis of certain kinds of pleural effusions, and you're right, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <coughs> here is a nice uh, photomicrograph of the parietal pleura here and the visceral pleura here, and I show this to give you an idea of the relationship uh, of the subpleural lymphatics here in the parietal pleura. Uh, here's uh, an opening into it here. Here's an opening into it here. Here's the mesothelial cells lining this one, the mesothelium lining this one. It's about 20 microns thick here in the pleural space. <coughs> so, proposed pleural purposes. Well, it's saran wrap around the lung, so it helps the lung maintain its shape. It provides a friction-free surface so that the lung can glide up and down against the chest wall. And those of you who have heard of pleural friction rub and have talked to patients that have pleuritic chest pain understand that the parietal pleura has pain fibers. And when patients have chest pain that's pleuritic, it's usually inflammation or tumor affecting the chest wall parietal pleura. Now recently, some people think there are sensory fibers in the visceral pleura. Uh, but the parietal pleura uh, pain fibers have been well established. It may assist the lung in deflation by providing some elasticity so as we relax and our lungs deflate, it can help the lung deflate. 
Uh, there is no evidence there is active exchange of fluid and solutes across the uh, pleura. They are very leaky, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and, of course, it does create a pleural space and uh, which we can learn a whole lot about our patients and what's going on with them and provides ample opportunity for all sorts of research to do. Okay, uh, Norman Staub at UCSF, uh, one of the major centers for plural research in this country, uh, and uh, some of his people published this many years ago, but it's still true today. This basically, in a nutshell, explains how fluid and particles get into and exit the pleural space. The intercostal vessels, which are under systemic pressure, are very close to the parietal pleura. And it is thought that they provide um, a considerable amount of the pleural fluid that goes, that, or, or the um, uh, fluid that goes from here into the pleural space. The um, bronchial vessels, the bronchial artery provides these vessels which are further away from the visceral pleura, but also um, pr uh, secrete fluid that eventually drains in through the very leaky membrane here, the visceral pleura, into the pleural space. The pleural space itself has a negative pressure, a slightly negative pressure gradient compared to the interstitial pressure in both the visceral, uh, the lung here and the chest wall here. So there's always a slight negative gradient here so that fluid can flow into the pleural space, you see? How does it leave the pleural space? Well, it leaves the pleural space through bulk flow, largely through those stoma, the holes in the parietal pleura. And you can document this by squirting carbon particles into the pleural space of an animal and then uh, sacrificing it and seeing those carbon particles exiting through the lymphatics in the parietal pleura. Um, fluid flux through the pleura is governed by Starling's Law, which um, is what we accept as governing the exchange of uh, fluid across uh, um, small vessels in our bodies. Um, the fluid movement through the pleural space, QF, is, con is determined by the surface area of the pleura, which is quite large, and the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries versus the pleural space, which is usually in favor of the capillary, and the oncotic pressure in the capillaries in the pleural space. So the higher the uh, capillary pressure, the more fluid will be filtered. Uh, the uh, lower the oncotic pressure, um, uh, you can see that will have an effect as well. Um, these are the forces that govern pleural fluid exchange. So a high, high uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure, you're going to filter more fluid. A low oncotic pressure systemically will, may result in accentuation of pleural fluid. There's only about 12 cc's of pleural fluid made a day. So you can see the pleural space, while quite small, doesn't have much fluid in it, and yet we all have tapped patients and gotten liters and liters out of them. So it can hold quite a bit of fluid. Normal values, um, it's really an ultrafiltrate of, of plasma. Uh, glucose is about the same as serum under normal circumstances. LDH and protein are quite low. There's a few cells in there, slightly alkaline. And of course, this is the classic x-ray that we were all taught. Should we tap this effusion or not? And this is something you think about. Uh, classically, we were taught that if it's 10 millimeters from the inside of the rib to the edge of the fluid, then it was safe to stick a needle in it if you did it carefully and you auscultated and percussed and did all the physical exam that you should do. Now we have ultrasound. So uh, perhaps that makes it safer. Perhaps we can even go after smaller amounts if it's necessary. Okay. Well, things really got revved up as, as far as um, helping us diagnose the kinds of disease processes we were dealing with when a man named Richard Light uh, published this sent Sentinel paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1972. I think at the time he was a fellow at Johns Hopkins. Um, so he published this paper in 1972, just doing, you know, clinical research in his section. And it has really been the gold standard from that point on and many people have come up with other alternative ways to separate transudates and exudates, but his scheme has persisted even to this day. So it was quite remarkable. He, he studied 150 cases of um, pleural effusions at Johns Hopkins, 
and he separated them out by obvious congestive heart failure, patients that had uh, elevated neck veins, big hearts, crackles, um, uh, obvious heart failure, uh, malignancies diagnosed by malignant cells in the pleural effusion, TB, pneumonia diagnosed by fever, purulent sputum and an effusion, and other exudates. These were mostly um, subpulmonic causes like pancreatitis, um, esophageal rupture, things like that. And he looked at things like um, uh, uh, protein in the pleural fluid and ratios. Now you can see this is the ratio of pleural fluid protein to serum protein for these different effusions. And you can see if you take about, this, this is what we use today, right? About 0.5. If you see, if you take 0.5, and draw a line across there, it's, it's a reasonably good separation of transudative effusions like heart failure versus all the rest which are exudates. But do notice that there are a number of malignancies that if you use this criteria alone could be classified as a transudate. And you see this periodically, don't you? Yeah. Uh, and also there are some um, obvious transudates that can be classified as exudates using this criteria alone. So you have to use some common sense. The same thing with uh, LDH as well. Uh, notice that most uh, uh, transudates have lower LDH levels. Most exudates have higher levels. Again, malignancy may overlap. So, uh, this is the man that did it all um, and he came up with this, these lights criteria as we call them today. Only one of these has to be fulfilled for it to be an exudate. Only one, not all three. Uh, and of course, uh, here's the ratio of the protein, the ratio of the LDH, uh, or the pleural fluid LDH two-thirds, the upper limits of uh, serum. Problems, of course, it's not perfect. Um, uh, you may misclassify both transudates and exudates. And particularly how staff be aware of this, when you have a patient that's been heavily diuresed, you may have a transudative effusion that's really a, that's almost a borderline exudate because of the, the protein sometimes leaves the pleural space a little slower in that circumstance. So if, it's, if the patient clinically has heart failure and you have a borderline exudate, it may well be that that is the case, that it really is a transudate and you've made the protein a little bit high by your diuresis. Uh, also, repeated thoracentesis in a single, symbol, uh, a single patient may result in some inflammation that can result in higher LDH levels, you know, because of the bleeding. You know, red cells are full of LDH. Uh, and some inflammation, white cells, things like that. Um, some tricks you can try um, in some of these cases is, is just subtract the pleural protein from the serum protein. If it's greater than 3.1, it's very likely a transudate, very likely. Uh, you can also measure in, in uh, kind of borderline exudates in heart failure patients. You can measure the pleural NTBNP. Can we get that here? Do we do that here? I know we do BNP. But it, anyway, if you can get the pleural NTBNP and it's greatly elevated, it's almost certainly from heart failure. This doesn't really apply to BNP apparently. Okay, observations of pleural fluid that are helpful. Well. First of all, you should look at the color. Uh, is it very pale? Uh, is it thin? Uh, most transudates are pale and thin, uh, look much like a nice glass of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you can see in this uh, wonderful example uh, how nice and, and, and pale and thin that appears. They're all three plural fluid. No, that's all uh, Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, is it bloody? If you're dealing with a bloody effusion, it may well be malignant. It may be uh, post-cardiac injury syndrome if they just had surgery. Uh, uh, asbestos. This is a very overlooked cause of, of bloody small pleural effusion. Asbestos exposure, benign asbestos uh, uh, disease. Not, I'm not talking mesothelioma. Um, pulmonary infarction. Don't forget PE. That can cause bloody effusion. If your effusion is kind of, uh, kind of greenish and turbid looking, uh, think about a chylothorax seen here in this 
wonderful image. Uh, here's a nice chylothorax that uh, we obtained on the ward some time ago. Uh, the triglyceride level is greater than 110, and it suggested that you get a pleural fluid and a serum cholesterol, but because occasionally some rheumatologic effusions can have a high uh, triglyceride level as well, but they will always have a low cholesterol. So, uh, really, a high triglyceride level and a low uh, pleural fluid serum cholesterol level, less than one, is what define a chylothorax, most commonly caused by tumor, usually lymphoma or trauma, for instance, surgery. The surgeon went in and was doing some work in the mediastinum and nicked the lymphatic duct. Um, and then there's the idiopathic case that probably occurs from overstretching or somehow tearing during exercise uh, the thoracic duct. Uh, there are other helpful things that you can observe. Uh, I've never seen black um, pleural fluid, have you, no. Ronnie? But they say that could be due to aspergillus. Um, uh, now, I have seen uh, anchovy paste from an amoebic liver abscess. We've had a, a run of those, I think, from Hemp Hill, Texas, many years ago, where uh, amoeba got in the water, and we got some patients with amoebic liver abscesses, and we had pleural effusions that look like anchovy paste. So that really happens. Uh, I've seen it. Um, viscous pleural fluid and mesothelioma. Don't forget to smell the pleural fluid. Um, uh, just, you don't have to stick your nose directly near it, but use the uh, wafting technique and see if you can smell anaerobes. Uh, that might be useful. And if so, don't treat them with uh, a Z-Pak or erythromycin, which is not a very good anaerobic drug. Um, or ammonia from a urinothorax. Now that would be interesting if you ever see one of those, but that it happens. A urinothorax. A urine in the plural space. Okay. Okay, in the beginning there was light. This is uh, Richard Light, <laughs> right here. Uh, Ronnie, I think this is probably in the 80s. I don't think he looked quite this way in the, in the 70s. Dr. George, seen here, appeared on the scene uh, to found our division in around 1972, and a few years later recruited this wild-looking individual, uh, Richard Light, uh, uh, to our institution where he stayed for several years and uh, actually published a number of papers on pleural disease. Both men came out with Sentinel books, Richard Light's book, uh, Pleural Disease, now in its fifth edition. I highly recommend this book if you have any interest in pleural disease. It's easy to read, he's an excellent writer, it's full of opinion, uh, but balanced with fact, uh, and it's, it's a great uh, book. I also recommend this wonderful uh, book, Chess Medicine, uh, which has uh, much of this wisdom in it, but in, in addition, much more about general pulmonary medicine. And it is an excellent book uh, for students of lung diseases, especially uh, medical students and house staff. If you have any interest in this, this is a great book. It's easy to read, and it's got lots of nice illustrations. Okay. Buy me some wine afterwards, Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, beginning, um, my beginning was... Uh, uh, Largely the result of both Ronald B. George and this man here, Gary Kanazowitz. Uh, in the early uh, 80s, uh, Gary organized the cardiovascular research uh, lab. And uh, you can see uh, all the, uh, uh, these hombres, these uh, uh, researchers here. You recognize this man right here. It's an early version <laughs> of Dr. Steve Levine. <laughs> Uh, we see Ed Deitch right here, who was chairman of surgery and, and I think later went to New Jersey. And he, uh, he was actually one of the guys that uh, described translocation of bacteria across the gut wall. Right? Yeah. Uh, we see Sushil Jain right here, uh, Peter Cavites, who uh, disappeared to Canada, and Matt Grisham, who only recently went to Lubbock to take over uh, Texas Tech's micro, uh, no, physiology yeah, department, chair of physiology. chair of physiology to this day. An excellent bicyclist. So, uh, this is where I got my start. So every day I would rise early and I would starch my white coat. Uh, I would put on a tie and I would go to the uh, cardiovascular research laboratory uh, to mess with my using chambers. Uh, these were wonderful devices. Um, Dr. Kanazowitz uh, sent me out to uh, UCLA to a friend of his, Ed Crandall's lab. And I spent a month in a dark lab in the bowels of UCLA learning how to work these devilish devices. Uh, but I did learn them. 
and they served me quite well. I got a number of publications out of them, uh, a little bit of money and a lot of uh, fun and uh, I learned some of the scientific method. And although my basic science career was short-lived, I learned a lot about life and some about basic science and techniques that uh, serve me well to this day. Um, this was my Sentinel publication, Comparative Permeability of Canine Visceral and Parietal Pleura. Now the way this happened was this was not my idea, you must understand. This was Dr. Knazowitz's idea because he had an NIH grant and uh, he had a dog model and he would wrap the dog's lung with a, with a sack, with an impermeable sack and study pleural fluid flux. But one of the criticisms of his NIH grant was that he assumed that the visceral pleura was very leaky, but there was not much published about that. So my assignment was to prove that the visceral pleura was very leaky, and I did so after much effort. And I, in fact, threw the parietal pleura in for good measure. And it was also very leaky, even leakier. So that was my publication uh, in uh, 1988, I think. A lot of work into that. Now others uh, really took the plural um, the football and did far more than I ever did. Uh, Dr. Milligan sitting here today, Dr. Owens who is not sitting here today, uh, took this and uh, at the VA established a, really a mesothelial cell research center uh, where they published a whole lot about, as you can see, all different aspects of these tiny little cells. They made nitric oxide, they made all sorts of cytokines, all sorts of growth factors, uh, and uh, they got much money uh, from this, uh, these efforts. The plural space is a wonderful thing to become involved with. It's easy to get to, it's clinically relevant, and you can do, and, and there's, there's still a lot to be done in the plural space. Um, a lot of experiments, a lot of things that can be looked at, as I'll show you in a minute. Okay, now let's get down to the kind of the nitty gritty, the transudates versus exudates. That's what you'd like to hear. I know you're dying to hear transudates versus exudates. Now, for transudates, really, we're talking heart failure. Most of the time, it's heart failure. It's usually bilateral on the chest x-ray. Um, hepatic hydrothorax is not that common. Usually, you have ascites, and usually, it's right-sided. So if you have a patient that has a lot of ascites and has a right-sided pleural effusion, it's probably from that. How does that get from here to here? Well, People have looked at that. They've injected air into the belly and watched it with a thoracoscope come up through defects in the diaphragm. That's how it happens. Um, and uh, it's difficult to treat, but it can be treated. Pericardial disease is another thing that can, like constrictive pericarditis, is a, you don't think about that much, but it can cause a transudative pleural effusion. Nephrotic syndrome, um, all, all the others are fairly rare um, uh, causes. So mostly it's heart failure, nephrosis, low albumin, and liver disease. Okay, heart failure. This is something I think we have increasingly, increasing amount of trouble diagnosing in our place. I'm not quite sure why, but let me tell you, heart failure is extremely common. Uh, Left-sided heart failure, diastolic dysfunction causes heart failure just, just like systolic dysfunction does. And um, here's a typical x-ray, of course, you would all recognize this as heart failure, a big heart, interstitial markings, curly B lines out here, and bilateral effusions. Usually heart failure effusions are bilateral. They're not unilateral, they're bilateral. Now it may be bigger on the right than the left for reasons that are unclear. Right lung's a little bigger than the left, maybe that's the reason. Uh, but they're hardly ever unilateral and they're vanishingly rare to, on the left side only. Uh, of course the uh, CAT scan might look something like this with your fluffy infiltrates down here and your pleural effusion. Uh, in some studies, uh, only 19% were unilateral only, and only 9% were unilateral left-sided. So if you've got one of these things, um, you might want to think about, is this really heart failure? Uh, typically, if you're convinced it's heart failure, they've got a big heart, they've got crackles, they've got a gallop maybe, they've got orthopnea, they've got elevated uh, JVD, they've got edema, you don't necessarily have to tap a pleural effusion if there's no fever or you don't have any reason to suspect anything else. You can treat them and it should go away. Now, if it doesn't go away, if they get worse or if it's unilateral, you might want to tap it to make sure. 
Exudates, now these are the really interesting ones because a lot of things can cause them, but again, you only have to remember uh, neoplasm and infection to cover the vast uh, majority of them. Don't forget PE though, because that's a, an overlooked cause. So really think of those three things first. Um, here's your paranomonic effusions and empyema. Um, as I explained before, any pleural effusion associated with a bacterial pneumonia is a paranomonic effusion. All empyemas are. Now some paranomonic effusions certainly are not empyemas. They're not gross pus, but they have a lot of inflammatory cells like neutrophils in them, uh, and uh, they may uh, wall off and become quite complex to deal with. Um, they, studies have shown that if you develop a paranomonic effusion, certainly an empyema in the presence uh, of pneumonia, this really increases the morbidity and mortality in your patient. It's best to get it out and it's best to get it out as soon as you can because the darn things, what they do is they wall off. This is the body's attempt to contain infection. So within 24 to 48 hours, um, the protein-rich, LDH-rich exudate in the pleural space begins to attract fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts do their job quite well of walling off parts of this effusion. And that makes it really hard to drain and you need to drain it frequently. So you, the sooner you drain it, the better off you're gonna be and probably your patient. So if you have somebody with a fever, an infection, a pneumonia, and they have a pleural effusion, by, by all means tap it as soon as possible, but I would recommend just draining the whole thing with a thoracentesis kit if you can. That's the easiest way to do it. Don't just get some pleural fluid and send it off for cultures and wait and see what happens. If they got fever and it looks like pneumonia, just drain the whole thing if you can. Drain it and just be done with it. That's the way to do that. Um, <clears throat> when you use antibiotics in these cases, don't give them erythromycin or, you know, that's not very good because frequently anaerobes are involved in these cases. Um, I don't think rocephin's so good either. I mean, Dr. Chaudhry, you can, you can kick me later, but I really think if you want to if you want to go after these things, use clindamycin or use a psyllin type drug. Zosin's a good drug. Remember, you got staph, you got uh, strep pneumonia, uh, you got MRSA in there. Uh, so you need to use some serious antibiotics if you're dealing with a pleural effusion in the presence of an infection. Um, small versus um, small tubes versus large tubes. Uh, the debate rages on. Um, I can't. There's no question that, that bigger tubes will help drain the pleural space faster in most cases if you can get one in. Now by the time we see a lot of our patients, they've had a pleural effusion from an infection for a while and it may be walled off pretty good. And the ultimate way to fix that is decortication, which is a huge and hairy operation in which the patient is taken to the operating room, put to sleep, and the surgeon does a thoracotomy and literally scrapes the rind off of the lung. It's, it's a big and bloody operation. And uh, we really want to avoid that if possible. If you have to, you have to, but the patient needs to be able to tolerate it. So before we get to that spot, it's good to drain the pleural effusion with either a small tube or, or a, a large tube. Thrombolytics have been tried. It's a little bit of controversy in the, liter in the literature, but I think the, the, the opinion seems to be swinging toward using them in refractory cases. Uh, and Dr. Jimenez and I recently had the opportunity to use thrombolytics in a case of a loculated uh, a pleural effusion, a paranomonic effusion, and uh, we can attest that it's not without its complications. Um, uh, we did cause some chest pain and, and in fact a hemothorax resulted from our attempts at using DNA and TPA. Now, these are well recognized uh, side effects and, and not to dissuade you, that's why you have a consent form. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, anyway, I do think we overall helped the patient. The patient got better and she did leave the hospital? Yes, she did leave, that's good. Um, video assisted thoracoscopy can be done by an experienced surgeon. It's not quite as um, um, involved as, as doing a thoracotomy. Uh, the holes are much smaller. And if it's early enough, a VATS can be quite useful in, in uh, cleaning up the pleural space. Oops. Okay, um, what are some signs that you may be dealing with a complicated pleural effusion, okay? Well, if you've got pus in the pleural space, all of this stuff basically um, defines an, an empyema. 
But other things can help you understand that you may be dealing with an effusion that's going to wall off quickly on you. A low, a low pleural fluid glucose is a bad sign. A low pH, which is basically the same as this, since the reason you get a low pH is because your cells in the pleural space metabolize a glucose. So these are bad signs. Um, high LDHs, loculations, frequently alert you to the fact you may have to resort to early <coughs> chest tubes at the very least, and maybe even vats or decortication. Just expect problems. Um, this is a very useful slide because this is a key image that you need to burn into your minds. Okay, this, this is a, an example of when you need to stick a chest tube in perhaps, or uh, of some sort, and when you should not. Okay, on, the, on, the, uh, on your left is a loculated um, uh, empyema. Uh, notice it's heavily loculated, it's got a little bronchopleural fistula here, and these arrows point to a very important finding, the split pleura sign, okay? The pleura lights up nicely and you can see it, and this basically ind indicates that you're dealing with something that's in the pleural space, in this case an empyema. On the other hand, this is a lung abscess. Notice it also communicates with the airways, um, and you should not stick a chest tube into this. That's not good, so don't do that. Notice the angle right here. This indicates, this is an acute angle, and this indicates that that uh, density is within the lung and is not in the pleural space. Notice the angle here is obtuse, indicating just the opposite. Okay, tuberculous pleuritis. We see this, don't we? We see this with some frequency. Um, it can be hard to diagnose, and I think one of the things you have to do is have a high index of suspicion, and you need to get a good history. Has the patient been working in a healthcare facility like a nursing home? Have they been in prison? Have they been living with somebody that has tuberculosis that would give them a tuberculous pleuritis? There's really a couple of syndromes. One is the acute syndrome where they've had fever and maybe fever, cough, and chest pain for just a week or two, and the other is a more chronic presentation uh, where they can come in with weight loss and uh, weakness. They're, they're usually almost always unilateral, okay? So this may help you in, in your uh, differential diagnosis. They can be from either primary infection or reactivation TB, um, uh, in which case, is a primary infection, this may well represent a delayed hypersensitivity reaction of the pleura. Now, it's like a PPD. If you do a PPD, um, there's antigen there and you draw in lymphocytes and you get a big bump. And the pleura is the same way. If there's little tuberculous antigen around, um, it attracts all these lymphocytes and this protein-rich rich exudate, and it's really the same kind of deal as a positive PPD. And in fact, pleural fluid cultures may be negative in a large percentage of the time because it's more or less a hypersensitivity reaction and not really an infection per se in the pleural space. Um, and a third of these folks can have a negative PPD. If they do and you still suspect it, by all means repeat the PPD in two to three weeks. It may well turn positive. Um, there are other tests that may be useful, uh, but you really have to have a high index of suspicion uh, you can try a, a quantiferon test. I'm not sure that's much better than a PPD in this circumstance. Uh, you certainly want to get some sputum and culture it for AFB to see if they've got uh, TB in their lung. Maybe do an imaging study to see if they've got some fibrocavitary disease somewhere. The pleural fluid's going to be an exudate. And a nice tip off here is that it almost always has a very high pleural protein, really high. So if you see a very high pleural protein in a unilateral effusion, that should really start you thinking about tuberculous pleuritis. And it's usually lymphocytic. However, if you catch it early, it may actually be neutrophilic before it turns to lymphocytes. Uh, we mostly see the lymphocytic form, but very early it may actually have neutrophils. The glucose is usually normal, but it can be low. It's one of the three or four causes of a low pleural uh, glucose. Um, we used to do a lot of closed pleural biopsies right here with either a Cope or an Abrams needle. And this is still the best way to um, get tissue uh, to look for those uh, caseating granulomas and to culture. 
because with a closed or an open pleural biopsy, you can actually get uh, culture material. Uh, and if you live in an area where there's lots of resistant TB, this is probably a useful thing to do. Um, however, we do far less now because of the advent of pleural fluid ADA, which, in, you know, if you have a, a high prior probability, it can be quite accurate. Um, uh, you can also measure interferon gamma. PCR is uh, occasionally used as well. Um, but uh, high pleural fluid ADA, I think, is what we commonly use here in, if we suspect uh, uh, tuberculosis. You don't need to drain the effusion unless they're symptomatic. If they have a lot of symptoms and it's huge, you might drain some of it. But be aware, this thing is going to go away on its own. It will go away. Um, the problem is, if you don't treat it, um, a lot of those folks, uh, uh, about half of them will develop uh, active pulmonary TB within five years. So this is the reason we treat it. And the treatment's basically like pulmonary TB. Okay, malignant effusions. Okay, that's the other big category I just want to uh, briefly mention. Um, there are a number of mechanisms. Okay, what's a malignant effusion? Okay, it's an effusion with malignant cells in it or malignant tissue. Now, there's another category called paramalignant, and we've all seen this. It's, it's caused by cancer, but there's no malignant cells in the pleural fluid. Why is that? Well, it's probably because you have other mechanisms responsible for that formation, including uh, post-obstructive pneumonia, uh, post-radiation therapy, low protein, something like that. Um, but that's, those, there's an indirect way they form, and there's a direct way. And this is pretty interesting. It was to me. Um, you always read that uh, pleural metastases can cause an increase in permeability across uh, the pleural, uh, pleural membranes, and this was poorly supported. Um, we've all also read, uh, remember tumor-induced fever? There was some literature early on about tumor-induced fever, and you give them aspirin and it, it gets better, things like that. Uh, this was a fascinating thing to me, and I'll show you what I did with it in a minute. Um, Obstruction of the pleural lymphatics can cause malignant effusions, mediastinal lymph node obstruction, uh, bronchial obstruction. This is very important uh, to be aware of that. Um, I became interested in the uh, theory that pleural metastases could cause an increase in permeability. So what I did is I uh, took my little using chambers that you saw and I took some nitrocellulose filters and I went to the slaughterhouse here in town and I got some cow aortas. Okay, they were already going to, you know, where they went. So I harvested the aorta, scraped out the endothelium, endothelialized the nitrocellulose filter, uh, and then put them in my using chamber to separate the two halves, and put albumin in one side that's labeled with carbon-14, and um, saw what happened. Now, I took some of those filters, and I exposed them to adeno human adenocarcinoma condition media, and I exposed some to squamous cell condition media and then I had a control group. And I saw what effect exposure to these malignant cells had on the uh, permeability of albumin through that endothelial monolayer over time. And as it turned out, both the squamous cell and the adeno caused an increase in permeability, which was blockable uh, with the use of endomethacin in the case of adeno, but not in the case of uh, squamous cell. Furthermore, in the adeno carcinoma, um, exposed endothelial monolayer, you saw changes in the cytoskeleton. The cells actually contracted. There was actual, and they opened up spaces on the filter. And presumably that was the reason the permeability went up. So this was pretty interesting. We uh, further isolated something, uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha that we thought was involved because uh, uh, the adenocarcinoma line made a lot of that and it was blocked when we blocked it with endomethacin. So we postulated perhaps that was involved. So, Anyway, that's still an area that's uh, out there for investigation, potentially important. Um, uh, we actually uh, tried it out on some patients. Uh, we uh, put, when they came in for malignant effusion, we had put chest tubes in them and used them as their own control, drained them for a day or two, got a stable drainage, and then gave them endomethacin. We did seven patients like that, and three or four of the seven actually had a decrease in pleural fluid drainage with endomethacin. When we stopped the endomethacin, the pleural fluid drainage increased. Uh, that was published in abstract form only, uh, uh, but it was in, an interesting correlate to this. So what do you, how do you think about a malignant pleural effusions? Well, obviously you have to do a diagnostic thoracentesis. Uh, they may be positive or negative. Um, 
Um, uh, if, the, uh, di if you can't find any cells, you might want to repeat the uh, uh, thoracentesis. Uh, you can do a, a closed pleural biopsy. You can do thoracoscopy, which I'll show you in just a minute. That's a great way to get a diagnosis. Um, it's important to think about what you need to do with patients with malignant effusions because their survival depends on a lot of things. Um, first of all, let me say that treatment of malignant pleural effusions probably does not influence survival per se in most <coughs> cases. So really what you're trying to do is give the patient some, some relief from their symptoms and this is important because if they have minimal symptoms, you might not want to do too much. Whereas, but it, that being said, eventually most people with malignant effusions are going to have symptoms. Um, you need to think about the type of tumor they have. Uh, patients with breast cancer, small cell lymphoma, ovarian, these tumors tend to do, uh, these patients tend to do a little better with malignant effusions than those that have non-small cell lung cancers. They tend to do uh, worse. You need to think about how much they're involved, how much of the, of the patient the tumor is involving. If it's widely metastatic, it's everywhere, and uh, the patient has a poor Karnofsky performance status score. Um, uh, they have, and these things have been described in the, in the serum as, as being poor uh, uh, biomarkers for survival, then these things uh, speak to somebody that's not going to last very long. And in fact, if you look just at performance score alone, uh, folks that have a high performance score tend to do much better over time <coughs> than those that don't. In fact, the 50% uh, survival here is about six months, which is about right for most malignant pleural effusions, four to six months. The exceptions being breast cancer, perhaps, small cell, uh, if they get uh, chemotherapy, uh, lymphomas, things like that. Um, management. Well, um, therapeutic thoracentesis, certainly if they have symptoms. Uh, if that doesn't improve them, then I would simply, you don't necessarily have to do that again, just treat their other symptoms. Uh, it may be they have a trap lung, or maybe they have an intrabronchial obstruction, something like that. Uh, if they do improve, then there's a number of things you can do, as I'll show you in a minute. If, beware, though, and, and look at their x-ray. If they have shift of the mediastinum toward the effusion, that's kind of a, that should make you pause and think about why that's occurring. There may be a, an intrabronchial obstruction, and you would do well to look in the airways first to make sure there's not an obstructing tumor. Uh, because uh, if you drain the pleural effusion, it'll come right back because of negative intrapleural pressure. Um, so the treatment options, and this is a nice list from up to date, for asymptomatic effusions, uh, observation, although most will eventually progress and require therapy. Therapeutic thoracentesis, you can just keep repeating that. If they just require one thoracentesis every few weeks, you can probably do that as an outpatient. If their survival is not going to be that long, it's probably not a bad approach. Uh, uh, catheter drainage. You can do a number of uh, catheters. Uh, what we prefer here uh, in patients that uh, can uh, uh, have the willingness to take uh, care of it and family members that are supportive is to put a Plurex catheter in. Uh, as you, I think you all have seen Plurex catheters. Uh, the, uh, uh, I guess I don't have that one. The Plurex was actually, uh, uh, d this was one of the study sites for the Plurex catheter. It was developed here as well as several other places. And it's quite useful in letting the patient really take charge of their own therapy, usually frequently put in as an outpatient in other centers, and uh, the patient go home, goes home with an indwelling catheter and drains the pleural fluid whenever they get short of breath into a vacuum bottle, dumps it in a toilet, flushes it away. Um, it's really helped a lot of these folks get out of the hospital earlier, spend a lot more quality of time home instead of in a hospital. We still do, on occasion, the uh, chest tubes with, with talc installation, uh, two to five grams of talc through a chest tube. Uh, it does work mm, 70 to 90 percent of the time, depending on the patient, um, but that does require a more extended hospital stay. Don't forget, um, if you have a patient that has a big pleural effusion and has small cell lung cancer and they're symptomatic, will drain some of the effusion, but be aware that treatment of the small cell and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but treatment of the small cell may well make that effusion go away. Same can be said for lymphoma. So don't get too aggressive in sticking a bunch of tubes in somebody that's about to get chemotherapy uh, for those sorts of uh, cancers. Um, if you have a 
pretty healthy patient that's got breast cancer with a pleural effusion and they're a surgical candidate. Uh, people in our division have not infrequently asked a surgeon to take the patient to the OR, put them to sleep, and uh, uh, do a uh, 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 pleural stripping, pleural <coughs> abrasion, talc insufflation, which basically works 100% of the time. The patient's asleep. Uh, they have a chest tube in afterwards for a few days, but that, ba that takes care of the problem. And patients that are in good shape are going to live for several months to even a year or two, that's not a bad approach. Okay. Medical pleuroscopy is, um, is something that uh, I think uh, we're interested in getting into in our section. Uh, this can be done in a bronchoscopy suite. It's basically, honestly, it's easier than putting in a chest tube because you can see what you're doing. And this, in this technique, uh, two or three holes, well, what is it, two holes? Two holes are made in the, in the chest wall, pleuroscope goes through one, light source maybe in the other, or an instrument. And you can look around inside the pleural space and biopsy whatever you see. That's what it looks like. There's somebody laying on the table. Um, and what you can see is stuff like this. There's some tumor, and you can see that'd be easy to biopsy. And you'll get a diagnosis for sure. They can, they can see it right away. Uh, uh, the pathologists come to the uh, bronchoscopy suite and you can make the diagnosis right away and then you can insufflate some talc in there, put a chest tube in and come on out and you've diagnosed and treated the patient in one fell swoop. Now that, that's nice. Um, it has an excellent uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing uh, tumors. Uh, better than a closed pleural biopsy and certainly a thoracentesis and you can uh, treat them at the same time. Uh, just this was a paper published uh, some of many of these patients came for th this institution on the Plurex catheter and there it is. Y'all have seen this haven't you? Y'all I mean just I don't know maybe so. Anyway this, here's the catheter it's uh, 15 French, it's got multiple fenestrations. Here's a little polyester Dacron cuff, goes under the skin. You uh, tunnel to put it in the patient. All this stays in the patient. This is outside the patient, coiled up on the chest wall. And whenever they get short of breath, they pull out their vacuum bottle and connect this end to this end and drain their own pleural effusion until they're not short of breath. And then they coil the catheter up, paste it back on their wall, put a waterproof seal over it dump the pleural effusion and maybe they'll go for a few days until they need it again. About 50 to 70 percent of the time within two months they'll have a pleurodesis of the pleural space from the chronic inflammation created by the catheter. So that will take care of the problem. It's which time you simply pull out the catheter, get rid of it. So this I think has been a huge advance in the treatment of malignant effusions. Okay, hard to diagnose pleural effusions. Up to 25 percent of cases um, what do you do? You, you've followed somebody with a pleural effusion for a long time, you still can't figure it out. Well, you've got to think about stuff. You've got to sit down and think about it. You've got to contemplate. You've got to go back over the history. Have you missed anything? Have they worked with asbestos? Could these be benign asbestos effusions? Uh, have they taken drugs that could cause pleural effusions? PEs, did you miss a PE? Collagen vascular disease. Trapped lung is probably a very common cause of undiagnosed pleural effusion. The lung won't come up. I'll show you that in a minute. Do some more imaging studies, CAT scan, see if there's interstitial lung disease developing. Uh, repeat the thoracentesis if you need to. Repeat the PPD so you don't miss a tuberculous effusion. You can get the uh, surgeon to do a VATS. Or you can observe over time. If it's a malignant effusion, it's not going to go away. It'll get worse. You don't want to miss a tuberculous effusion because if you do, half those people develop pulmonary TB. So repeat the PPD. Uh, that being said, generally these folks have a favorable outcome from the very few studies that have been done. This is an excellent clinical trial or, you know, retrospective trial that could be looked at among patients in this hospital, is looking back to see what happened to patients that still have a pleural effusion a year later. Pleural wisdom. I'm going to end on pleural wisdom. This won't take long. Just some pearls that uh, can be helpful when you see patients with pleural effusions. Trap lung. This is um, something that we probably miss more often than we diagnose. What is trapped lung? Well, trapped lung simply means the lung has a piece of uh, thickened visceral pleura over it that's trapped it so it can't expand. And since the nature abhors a vacuum, you're going to fill the space up with pleural fluid. You drain the pleural fluid and it looks like this. And guess what? It comes right back. It comes right back. 
Now you didn't give this person the pneumothorax. That's, that's what you're gonna think. You didn't do that. That was already there. That fluid was there because the lung's not expanding, you see? And how do you know it's a trap lung? Well, if you really wanna find out, get a plural fluid, a uh, plural manometer. And we have those, don't we have those? You can put them in there and you, if the plural's if the pleural space has a really negative uh, pressure, when you take out just a little bit of fluid, the pleural pressure goes way down negative, you're probably dealing with a trap lung. And you need to, the, the, ultimate, uh, sit, the ultimate fix of this is to strip off the visceral pleura. But that's surgery. Okay, here's another thing. Now you didn't do this either. This was caused by um, obstruction of a bronchus. This is called a pneumothorax ex vacuo. You ever have a situation where you have a huge pleural effusion and, and say the intern on your team sticks a needle in that and the lung's like this big on the CT scan and, and you end up and it looks like you have a pneumothorax after the tap and you go, what happened? How could I possibly have poked a hole in the lung? Well, probably you didn't. You may have a pneumothorax ex vacuo. Lung, the lung was already down or a piece of the lobe was already down because there's a tumor in one of the airways and that part of the lung collapsed and then you have uh, pleural effusion to take up the space. So you simply exposed the situation for what it was, you see? This patient probably needs a bronchoscopy. Okay, if you have a large effusion with no mediastinal shift, beware of sticking a chest tube in before you do a bronchoscopy because the patient may have a, um, uh, an obstruction in a bronchus. And, and if you stick a chest tube in there, you're really not gonna get the lung up and may make the situation worse. So bronchum first, there's an obstruction, find out what it is and treat it, and then this may resolve on its own. On the other hand, if you have a huge effusion with mediastinal shift, uh, stick away. Uh, it should uh, correct the situation. Bloody effusions, three things, malignancy, trauma, PE, conventional wisdom. Of course, there's other things that can do this, but that's conventional wisdom. Low pleural fluid glucose, rheumatoid pleuritis, TB, empyema, and malignancy. Eosinophilia, this is always puzzling. We think this should mean something very profound when we see pleural fluid with lots of eosinophils. Well, uh, usually actually it's a good sign. Usually means they don't have a uh, uh, tumor. Um, pneumothorax, uh, chronic pneumothorax can do this. Benign asbestos effusion, resolving infections are idiopathic. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this, we're out of time. So. That's my thoughts on pleural effusions. Uh, you'll see a lot of them. They're actually um, quite gratifying to diagnose and treat. Um, read the literature, it's not rocket science. That's the other good thing about this. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Where'd you get the sunset picture?